<laughs> Telephone poles and then over the downs where they duck underground all the way to the local exchange. Change for the exchange. Here we are. Here we are. Doesn't look very important, does it? But it is. It's the first link that sends Mrs. Frobisher's call speeding on its journey around the world. It's an automatic exchange. Now, the first digit Mrs. Frobisher dialed was an O. And the automatic equipment here recognises that a trunk line is going to be needed for this particular call. So it routes her call to one of the bigger exchanges in town. Yeah? Come on. Here we are, one trunk exchange. Let's go. Let's go. Use the main door. That's it. Well done. Good. Come on, kids. So, the local exchange routed the call to this bigger trunk exchange because the first O that Mrs. Frobisher dialed showed it wasn't just a local call, but a trunk call. That is, a call which connects exchanges more than 24 kilometres apart. Now that first O is called the trunk access digit, but now the equipment here at the trunk exchange recognises the next three digits called routing digits. And those three digits give the equipment in this switching room enough information for it to recognise that it's dealing with an international call. And that means it needs to be switched to one of the international exchanges in London. So immediately the equipment starts searching for the quickest available route. And off goes the call, now in company with lots of other long-distance calls bound for other destinations. Right, come on, let's go. And those calls won't be travelling along twisted copper wire, but through cables like these. They're called coaxial cables, and they carry multi-channel, high-frequency signals over great long distances. And here's a section of that cable, so you can take a look at what it's like inside. It's got a central conductor wire and that travels through a conducting tube and the two are separated by this insulating material then there's an outer layer of plastic that protects the conductor wires and makes the whole thing watertight but no matter how good these cables are the electrical signals are bound to get weaker the further they have to travel due partly to the resistance of the copper conductors you see electrical signals have to push their way along telephone wires some metals resist this push more than others. And although copper is a very good conductor, the signals still have to be boosted by small amplifiers called repeaters to make sure they arrive without loss of strength and with almost no distortion at the next switching point. Let's go. Right, off you go. That's it, well done, you know where you're going. Now usually repeaters are housed at exchanges, but sometimes they're housed in holes in the ground, like this one. OK, there's our incoming cable with our telephone message on it. Now, if it goes much further than this, it's going to get weak and fade. So, it's passed through a repeater, which amplifies the signal and sends it on its way to London just as strong and just as clear as when it started its journey. But it might be that there's going to be less and less need for repeaters like these because British Telecom are in the process of introducing this optical fibre cable. It's made up of tiny strands of glass, each as fine as a human hair, and light can be sent along these fibres, even though they may bend into all sorts of curves, and then by flashing the light on and off, very rapidly, signals can be sent to a distant location. What's more, 
one pair of optical fibers would typically carry 2,000 or more simultaneous conversations, and each cable can carry several pairs of fibers. They can be used for land and undersea cable, and it's easy to see why British Telecom and British Telecom International are making the changeover from coaxial cables. But there's still another way Mrs. Frobisher's signal could have been carried to London, and that's via British Telecom's microwave network. No doubt you've seen the dish-shaped aerials which concentrate the microwaves into parallel beams of energy and send them to distant aerials. If Mrs. Frobisher's call had been sent to the microwave station further along the coast, it would have travelled to the telecom tower in London in a series of straight-line hops from aerial to aerial all across the country until it finally arrived at the dish aerials on the tower and into the international exchange. Now, I'll be telling you some more about microwaves a little bit later on. But now, the first available route is on that multi-channel coaxial cable I was telling you about earlier on. That takes it all the way to London. But what happens when it gets to an international exchange? What route does it take? Which way does it go? Well, there are several routes that it could take. We're going to trace some of them now. Right, here we are at the famous old stone globe at Durlston Head. It's been here over a hundred years, long before there were transatlantic telephone calls, but it's absolutely perfect for tracing the route that Mrs. Frobisher's call is taking. The call begins its journey around the world from one of the international exchanges in London, where the equipment recognises the country code digits as a call to Australia and immediately begins searching for the quickest available route of all the various routes it could take. It could go like this, or it could go like this. Or, of course, it could go via a communication satellite like Intelsat 5, which orbits over the Indian Ocean at a height of 36,000 kilometers. It can handle up to 12,000 telephone calls at one time and two TV channels. So Mrs. Frobisher's call could have been beamed up and back to a satellite Earth station in Australia. But today, as it turns out, our call is going not via satellite, but via Cantat 2, which is an undersea cable that runs from Widdermouth Bay on the north coast of Cornwall across to Beaver Harbour, Nova Scotia. So, Mrs. Frobisher's call is directed by the International Exchange in London, right across country on coaxial cable, which it could be sharing with thousands of other telephone calls at the same time, ready to plunge into the sea at Widdermouth Bay. It's around here somewhere, definitely. Definitely on this stretch. Stop! Stop, stop! There it is, right there! Here, I'll go and run that up against the rock. Now then, if you had X-ray eyes, you could go down five feet below here. This is what you'd find. It's called, if I can remember what it's called, unarmoured coaxial cable, sheathed in polythene. Now, the thing about it is, it has to go out under the sea, down to depths of sometimes 5,600 metres. The great thing about it is here, in the business bit, it can actually carry up to 1,840 telephone conversations simultaneously. And it does that by combining all those conversations into one high-frequency signal, a bit like your radio set at home. Now, of course, you couldn't really find a cable like this with a metal detector because it's buried so deep down. Now, where's this cable off to? Well, that's what we brought our beach ball map of the world for, so we could have a look right now. It starts here, where we are, in the British Isles, and it sets off across the Atlantic. Now, on its way, it has to go over undersea mountain ranges that are even higher than the Andes. It has to go across crevasses that are much bigger than anything you'd find on land. And at the end, that message still has to arrive loud and clear. Not only that, the cable has got to stay 100% reliable year in, year out. So, when Cantat 2 that's what they call this particular stretch of cable, Cantat 2, was laid, British Telecom experts had to pay special attention to the route. They surveyed the seabed, they studied the currents and tides, they discovered all they could about the activities of the fishing fleets. The survey ship was fitted with satellite navigation equipment, which was able to calculate its position very accurately indeed, even when it was a thousand miles from land. 
The design engineers in charge of the cable laying project had to take special care when they were selecting the components and materials which the cable and its repeaters were to be made from. These repeaters, you want to go and get one from over there, all right? They're a bit like uh, the repeaters that we saw in that hole in the ground a little while ago, remember? Yeah? And they're shaped, there we go, a bit like torpedoes, see? This is just a model of an undersea repeater. The real ones are about three metres long. Now, they have to be protected, though, from the tremendous pressure that you get at the bottom of the ocean by these really strong steel jackets. They're spaced at intervals of just over 11,000 metres, right the way across the Atlantic, a total of 473 in all. At Beaver Harbour, Mrs Frobisher's call starts on the next leg of its fantastic journey, a 6,300 kilometre leapfrog across an entire continent on one of the three microwave networks across Canada, linked together by more than 150 repeater stations. I said we'd be looking at microwaves again, so let me try and explain what they are. Basically, they're extremely short radio waves, and they're used to send signals in straight lines from one dish aerial to another. So before they can begin their trans-Canadian journey, those tiny electrical signals, generated by the telephone handset in the lighthouse in England, will have to be converted to microwaves, and then sent up to the first dish aerial for transmission. Microwave repeater stations have to be connected by line of sight because microwaves can't travel through solid objects. So the Rocky Mountains, with peaks that rise to 4,000 metres, meant special problems when the microwave link across Canada was being planned. It's not surprising that this particular link in the chain was very expensive indeed to construct. Once over the Rockies, Mrs Frobisher's call reaches Vancouver. Now, Vancouver is a very important city. But the most important thing about it, as far as telecommunications engineers are concerned, is that it's the terminus for the 15,100 kilometre cable, ANSCAN. ANSCAN is the longest undersea cable in operation anywhere in the world. It carries telephone calls right across the Pacific Ocean at depths of up to five and a half kilometres. Now, at those sort of depths, it has to withstand great stresses and strains. So it's built around a central core of very strong, high tensile steel, which can survive great pressures without breaking. Folded around that central core is the copper conductor, which carries both the signal and the electricity needed to operate the repeaters. Now, once again, those repeaters are protected by very strong steel housings. And each of them contains something like 300 components many of which are gold-plated to prevent corrosion. Now, those repeaters are going to lie at the bottom of the ocean unattended for something like 20 years, so the designers have to make sure that they're going to operate for the whole of that time at peak efficiency. The route for the ANSCAN cable was planned so that it could surface three times during its journey across the Pacific. After it leaves Vancouver, it first pops up at Hawaii. Then it goes back underwater before it surfaces again at Fiji. Again, it plunges back into the South Pacific until it bobs up at Norfolk Island. Here, the cable divides, but Mrs. Frobisher's call is directed on for Sydney. The cable surfaces on Australia's famous Bondi Beach, 15,000 kilometres after plunging into the sea at Vancouver. Nearby, the Paddington International Gateway Terminal sorts out the incoming calls. The equipment reads off the digits which Mrs Frobisher dialed a few moments ago on a remote stretch of coast in England. This time, the equipment recognises the area code 9 as a call for Perth, and once again the search is on for the first available route. There are 40 different routes to choose from, but as it happens, it's a microwave link that's available at the moment. So once again, the call is converted into microwaves and flashed from one station to the next in line of sight leaps right across the continent to the hills around Perth. That's a journey of 4,800 kilometres. And so Mrs Frobisher's call arrives at Mount Yokine, the last microwave station in the chain. 
and there it's reconverted into electrical impulses and sent onto coaxial cable all the way to the local Perth exchange. Here, for the last time, exchange equipment reads off those electrical impulses generated in England and directs the call along a pair of copper wires that lead to Mrs. Frobisher's son's telephone. Of course, it's late evening here and everyone's enjoying a barbecue. Hello? Hello, yes. Yes, Mum, it's me. Yeah, yeah, we're all fine. It's really nice to hear from you. Hold on, Linda. Linda, it's Mum. So there we are. Mrs. Frobisher's call has reached that one particular telephone and no other out of the 450 million telephones there are in the world. Electrical impulses generated some 28,000 kilometres away have rung that telephone bell in Western Australia. They've crossed two continents, gone under two oceans, over snow-covered mountains and across scorching hot deserts. And it's all thanks to the worldwide telephone network of cables, communication satellites, optical fibre cables, microwave links, and of course some very advanced exchange equipment. It's a tremendous system and a great deal of effort went into building it. And it's still expanding, still reaching out to meet the needs of tomorrow's world. A hundred years ago when the stone globe was built, you might say that we were in the Stone Age too, as far as communications are concerned. But today, see for yourselves.